are explorers. We explore our lives day by day. And we explore the galaxy trying to expand the boundaries of our knowledge. And that is why I am here. Not to conquer you with weapons or with ideas, but to coexist and learn. Star Trek's central command and philosophy to seek out new life forms and new civilizations seems obvious on the surface. Step one, build a starship. Step two, go to warp. Step three, profit. Stavo! <laughs> that is Stavo, isn't it? <laughs> but it is trickier than it seems because it can be difficult to recognize a new life form upon first glance. Only giant bags of mostly water. Bags of mostly water. Sure. Some are easy. There are a lot of strange and bizarre creatures out there in fictional Star Trek land. It is easy to see the personhood in some of them. Pain! Even the more monstrous ones. But it can be tricky to recognize new life forms amongst your own ranks. And it is when the new life forms are already familiar to the characters and to the audience that Star Trek shines as both an allegory and a roadmap for what to do when you discover new life sitting right next to you. If shoe fits. Wear it. I'm Mr. Chekhov. The franchise typically conducts this conversation in one particular style, loud and obvious. Get on a Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it sits. However, in examining how Star Trek handles this conversation in connection to holograms, we might be able to see another, slightly more subtle approach. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start by going over some basic patterns of human behavior. You see, people don't always recognize humanity in the other. Human societies tend to separate themselves into economic or social castes that can sometimes include bottom rungs of non-people, or people deemed untouchables or outcasts, slaves most commonly, but also newcomers or undesirables of many stripes. Consider that in the history of many worlds, there have always been disposable creatures. While the Spanish Empire began to stretch itself out into the Americas, Spanish courts wrestled with the question of the plethora of Native American nations the Spanish encountered. Were they people just like the Spaniards? Or were they animals? Enslaved Africans faced similar repeated queries as justification for their enslavement. And the Nazis infamously described non-Aryans as subhuman. This is still a behavior pattern we deal with today, with how refugees and certain ethnic groups are treated around the world, with caste systems like the ones found in Southeast Asia, and even with this monkey, who doesn't exactly own this selfie even though he clicked the shutter. The point is this, who gets to be a person in the legal sense has changed throughout history and it has never been a positive experience for those excluded. In fact, wrestling with this distinction of personhood invariably brings out the absolute worst in humanity. It is something we not only still do to each other today, but something that, sadly, comes quite naturally to us. Faced with a sordid circumstance of this sort, it is no wonder that Star Trek, with its shiny 1960s space-age American optimism, opted to describe a future where all people were, well, actually people. Leave any bigotry in your quarters. There's no room for it on the bridge. Do I make myself clear? You do, sir. Star Trek preaches this gospel most ardently by proposing that the audience recognize the relative humanity of beings we haven't met yet, or could scarcely imagine as well as those who are already among us. If you call yourselves enlightened, you have to accept people who are different than you are. But how does the franchise typically draw attention to this lesson, whether it concerned the bizarre alien or the overlooked crewmate? Is it always a gospel delivered to a choir? Is the argument for personhood always delivered with the same loud and obvious fervor? We can take androids as a case study. Commander, what are you? An android. Which is? 
Webster's 24th Century Dictionary, 5th edition, defines an android as an automaton made to resemble a human being. We've dealt with androids in Star Trek before, but Data's case is the first time Star Trek took a hard look at whether or not androids can be people. It was a fine way for the franchise to, once again, pose the question, is this other, this thing, is it a person? Something to be respected and endowed with rights? Well, duh, said the franchise. The way the question of android personhood is answered is representative of how Star Trek handles the personhood question overall. But it is interesting that this question about androids specifically isn't framed from Data's perspective, per se, but from Captain Picard's. More specifically, in Picard's defense of android personhood or autonomy. Isn't that rather a sentimental attitude about androids? They're living, sentient beings. Their rights and privileges in our society have been defined. I help define them. Picard's position on androids comes from a place of deeply felt ideology. That seek out new life forms and new civilizations line. Yet Picard really believes that. New life can be found anywhere, he believes, and it should be recognized as such when he sees it. And Picard saw it in Data. So he decided to side with Starfleet ideals, as he does with pretty much everything, and not give in to the practicality of the situation, which is that sometimes it is really hard to tell where to draw the line. Remember that monkey selfie from earlier? Of course a monkey isn't a person. But should we recognize it as a kind of intelligent being with some inherent legal rights, anyway? Or is it just a thing to be used and processed by humans? It is tough for any of us to say definitively, right? At the very least, we can see the contours of the argument that the monkey should own the rights to his image. But I can guess what Picard would do. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. So I'm sentient, but... Monkey. There is not. That's right. Uh-huh. Why? Let's try another example. We can all agree that this coffee maker isn't alive, right? Well, what if one day it did this? Why won't you love me? Harder to tell, unless you are stone cold inside. But I can guess what Picard would do about it. I cannot exterminate something that may or may not be intelligent. My good captain. And that's not to say that Picard automatically sides with autonomy every time, exactly. He does need to be convinced sometimes. In the Next Generation episode, The Quality of Life, Data has to convince Picard and others that the Exocomps, a group of super smart multi-tools, are actually self-aware and alive. It doesn't take much convincing. Once he sees the possibility of Data's point, Picard comes around. Doctor, I appreciate your time constraints, but recognizing new life, whatever its form, is the principal mission of this vessel. His idealism is always at the ready, especially when it comes to determining whether something is self-aware or not. And it isn't just Picard. This question is a hallmark of Star Trek. In fact, we could rename the franchise to, is it self-aware? My rights, my status, my right to choose. Oh, it seems reasonably self-aware to me, Commander. So let's consider this a normal approach for Star Trek on the topic of, is it self-aware? Is it a person? A full-throated, idealistic template of how the franchise handles this question, if you will. Loud, obvious, practically screaming at the choir. So it is here that I'd like to bring up a slightly contrasting example. The holograms. This is all very complicated. Stop breathing down my neck. My breathing is merely a simulation. So is my neck. Stop it anyway. Is this a thruster control? Don't touch that. We don't know what it does. From the very beginning, holograms were defined as playthings. And perhaps because of this, holographic personhood was never really given the full consideration that other others have received, even from Picard. For example, when a holographic version of Professor Moriarty becomes self-aware, Captain Picard acknowledges that sentience and even begins to entertain the prospect that Moriarty is a brand new life form in the universe with inherent rights that should be respected. Please understand, Professor, that you are, in essence, a new life form, one that we didn't intend to create and that we don't fully understand. Now, the moral and ethical implications of deliberately creating another one like you are overwhelming. 
But instead of fighting for the legal status of Moriarty as he did with Data, he had Moriarty trapped in a computer simulation indefinitely, effectively imprisoning him. This wasn't without cause. Moriarty had created turmoil by taking over the ship and trying to find a way to escape the confines of the holodeck. Ultimately, Picard didn't place the holographic Moriarty on the same level as Data. He even made some crude joke after imprisoning the sentient hologram about how all life could be a simulation and we just wouldn't know it. But who knows? Our reality may be very much like theirs, and all this might just be an elaborate simulation running inside a little device sitting on someone's table. Jean-Luc Picard is far from the only one to be so dismissive of holograms despite their appearance of sentience. Many characters throughout the 24th century would adopt the same attitude. Even Dr. Louis Zimmerman, the creator of the emergency medical hologram, sometimes regarded holograms as merely tools. Sometimes. Activate the EMH. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. This is a level three diagnostic. I understand. By the time we get to Captain Janeway, we see this attitude on full display. Kes, he's only a hologram. He's your medical officer. He's alive. No, he's not. He's self-aware. He's communicative. He has the ability to learn because he's been programmed to do that. But ultimately, the emergency medical hologram known as the doctor, very much like Data, becomes another avenue through which the franchise can discuss the personhood of the other. As the Doctor's program remains operational throughout Voyager's long seven years trapped in the Delta Quadrant, he begins to change and grow beyond his programming. Reluctantly, Captain Janeway recognizes this. And this is where Janeway, and thus the franchise, takes a slightly different track in discussing the issue of personhood, perhaps whispering loudly to the choir instead of outright yelling at them. Compared to Picard's full-throated advocacy and idealism in his defense of Data, Janeway's slower-paced reaction is a much more normal response to the unusual circumstance of having a piece of technology ask for rights and privileges. I would like the right to vote, please. Where Picard would instigate a legal hearing, Janeway starts by giving the doctor the ability to turn himself on and off. Additional rights and privileges are added slowly, in a piecemeal, practical fashion across the years. Janeway next realizes that the Doctor's self-awareness is growing. In a particular instance, Janeway regrets altering the Doctor's program without telling him when he exhibits signs of remorse at the death of a fellow crewmate. She realizes that she would be very reluctant to alter a flesh and blood crew member in the same fashion. It's as though there's a battle being fought inside him between his original programming and what he's become. Our solution was to end that battle. What if we were wrong? In another instance, when the crew becomes annoyed at the Doctor's new daydreaming subroutine, Janeway sees through the fantasies to the Doctor's inner insecurities. Captain, this ship needs its Doctor. He should focus on what he was programmed for. Medical care. I think we've underestimated him because of our own human limitations. His full potential is unknown, Chakotay. A kind of friendship develops between Janeway and the Doctor in the process in contrast to the father-son relationship that Picard and Data develop. And each time the Doctor pushes further beyond his station, the relationship between him and Janeway becomes tense, as Janeway is forced to accept another element of the Doctor's growing personhood. What about your duty to Voyager? I take that very seriously, but- You're a part of this ship. You sound as if you're talking about a piece of equipment. That's not what I meant. Then shouldn't I be given the same respect as any flesh and blood member of this crew? Captain Janeway does help the Doctor, but her acceptance of him follows a much slower evolution than Picard's, much less grandiose than, say, a legal hearing. In many cases, she is more likely to think of the Doctor as a piece of technology rather than a person. As difficult as it is to accept, the Doctor is more like that replicator than he is like us. He would disagree. Janeway shares Picard's idealism but she is more conservative about broadening the definition of personhood to holograms. As such, her eventual full advocacy for the Doctor feels more realistic, more grounded in experience over time. Before Voyager went off the air, Janeway's individual experiences with the Doctor had broadened into explorations of storylines involving holograms rising up against their masters, creating societies and advocating for themselves and surprising their creators. 
The Doctor wins the right to be legally defined as an artist in order to control his hollow novel, Photons Be Free. By the end of the Voyager series, that hollow novel appears to be circulating among holograms back in the Alpha Quadrant, which represents a potential for social change. We might hope that the future of the Trek franchise will be holographic. After all, holograms appear to adapt, evolve, and proliferate much more quickly than androids. And there are certainly a lot more of them than androids, too. We might even expect the new Picard series coming up in 2020 to continue this trend line of holographic rights and representation somewhere in its world building. Or at least we think it should. However, the real takeaway here is in the subtle difference in Picard's reaction to androids and Janeway's reaction to holograms. Both are pleased toward the choir. But perhaps Picard's idealistic zeal in The Next Generation gives us space for Janeway's slightly more realistic, more practical path to woke. If Janeway's evolution is, indeed, closer to how you or I might react to the rights and privileges of sentient technology, then perhaps the Janeway-Doctor relationship is Star Trek's more useful model for seeking humanity in the other. At least, until we get another one. Greetings. Thank you for watching. So, a couple of things. First, thank you very much for chipping in with our fundraising goal. We're at nearly 70% of our target. That's very generous of you. Thank you. If you like this and other essays on this channel, then consider getting involved. Forgo that cup of coffee and help us reach our goal of hiring a second editor and doubling the number of videos we put on the channel. You know that's what you want. In other news, we'd like to announce a new podcast in the world called Wikisurfer. Trexpertise own Kyle Sullivan, along with Brandon Phibbs, a writer, director, producer, team up for an experiment in podcast storytelling that surfs through the endless hyperlink waves of the Wikipedia ecosystem. You can check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Additionally, we're close to launching our campaign for post-production funds for our short film, I See the Stars, a story about finding common ground, especially in the dark time after a loved one passes. We will provide more information soon, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Finally, we'd like to thank our patrons who make this whole thing possible, starting with a special thanks to Acting Ensign Ben Waterbear Pfeiffer and Lieutenant Chase Williams. Additional thank yous to our generous patrons Troy Bernier, Wellington Marcus, Samuel Umschneider, Paul Laker, Alex Blocker, Darren Descalar, David Radford, and Alex Zing, and all of the other patrons that make this ship go. Thank you. If you'd like to be notified when the next essay lands, then subscribe, turn on notifications, and or sign up for our no-nonsense email list. You can find all relevant links, Patreon, podcast, short film, etc., down in the subspace below. And don't forget to check out our new video postcard from Ushuaia over on our other channel. Thank you. See you soon. Toy show, 考えてみようよ。